Most C-sharp developers have what I like to call a half understanding of memory management and performance. We've all heard of the garbage collector, we've all seen struts around, heard that they're related to the stack in some way, maybe heard that they're good for small things, value types, reference types, allocations, closures, boxing, stack alloc, all these terms, a lot of us have heard them, but never had anything beyond a vague understanding of what they mean. What exactly does a strut do differently than a class? What does it have to do with the stack? Are struts always on the stack? I've seen a lot of people say they are, and spoiler alert, that's not true at all. All these different concepts get thrown at you over your time with C-sharp, and they're never really consolidated together into a simple, single explanation that goes right from the ground up and goes through it all and how it all interconnects at once. And that's what I'm here to do. Forget the terms, forget what you think you know about them, and sit back as I go from the bottom up and break down how this world works. This is Inside C-Sharp Memory. Let's start at the beginning. Every program you write in C-Sharp has its memory broken apart into two key pieces, the stack and the heap. These two words are the building blocks for everything that's to come in this video, so remember them well. There's one stack for each thread you have running, and the heap system as a whole is shared across everyone. The stack is a small region of memory that holds onto all your local variables and parameters, while the heap is a potentially massive region of memory that your program can slide objects into. We'll go through what an object is and what in your code uses the heap soon, but for now let's just hand wave that this is what they do. There are other regions of memory too. There's a native heap for C++ code, there's the loader allocator regions and a few other things, but to be honest, we don't care. It's really not important to our code directly and its performance. We keep it to stack and heap here. So let's look at these a little closer and get a little familiar with them. The stack is probably one of the simplest memory regions. It operates just like the data structure. Things can be pushed onto the stack, added to the end, and things can be popped from the stack, removed from the end. In this particular iteration of the structure, you can access the middle. So you can change items and you can read them from the middle, but you can't remove or insert items into the middle. Things have to come and go from the end, which is the similarity with the data structure that gives it its name. Okay, so that's all well and good, but <laughs> how is this useful? How does this model of pushing and popping get used to store local variables? It doesn't sound like a very good system to store those, but it's actually perfect. And the reason it's perfect is not because of the individual local variables, but because of the functions they're in. Calling and returning from functions are exactly like pushing and popping from a stack. And this is where the model gets useful. Let's write some code and I'll show you what I'm talking about. I'm in a .NET 7 project here. Nice top level console template, pretty standard. And I'm gonna write two functions. The first has a variable called A in it, while the second has a variable called B in it. There's some extra code between these local variables, but let's not worry about that too much. Now, let's see what happens on the stack when someone calls first. I'll do a visualization of the stack off to the side here. So we come down here and call first, very first thing in the program. And here's what happens. When you call a function, it pushes space for that function's local variables onto the stack. So when we do this, variable A, space for variable A's data, is pushed onto the stack since that's the local variable in there. And then we go through the method, run all this code in here, and when we get to this line, we call second. And once again, calling the function pushes its local variables onto the stack. So we push variable B onto the stack because we just went into second and second has a variable called B in it. And now the stack has both variable A and variable B. We go through second, it'll access B in there. And when we return from it, we pop the B off the stack because that was the variable in second. So now we're back to exactly where we were before we called second. If first wants to use the variable a anywhere, it's right there at a predictable distance from the end of the stack. It's not a problem. And then when we return from first, we pop a off the stack, and there we are, back to where we started. And that's how the stack works. The reason it's a stack is because that's how methods work. Think of a call stack. You push when you call a method, you pop when you return from a method. Now, listen, what's this star simplification all about? We don't like simplifications. We want the straight facts in here. So let's just get rid of that label and let me explain what that was about. The stack also contains some extra data needed to, well, 
make the entire function system work. Firstly, parameters. They're on the stack as well. In this case, it doesn't really have any impact, although these functions aren't static, so there probably is a catch there, but that's for another time, all right? Spoilers. But what the stack definitely does have that I didn't include in my diagram is some extra data per function that allows the entire return system to work. Have you ever asked yourself how the return keyword actually works? How does return know where to return back to? As far as second is concerned, we could have come from anywhere. It didn't have to be first. Somehow, somewhere, when the return instruction happens, there has to be information saying that we just came from first. Otherwise, it would never make it back. And there is. And it goes on the stack. Anytime you call a function, it pushes onto the stack where it was. So when it comes time to return, it can go back to where it was. So with this in mind, here's a better visualization of our stack when we're in second. You can see how every time we call a function, it also pushes a return address, a place in memory that the processor should go back to when it returns from a function. Knowing all about this is more of an assembly thing than it is a memory thing. But future video perhaps? Let me know if you want to see some assembly code. If you have a function with two local variables, space for both of those local variables are pushed onto the stack immediately. It doesn't matter if there's if statements between them, if they're in entirely different scopes within the function, space for every local variable in your current function is always pushed on when it's called. Now that we understand what the stack is, we can understand the stack overflow exception a lot better too. A stack overflow occurs when we call so many functions that push so much data onto the stack that we fill the stack up. The stack is only a limited size and it's not very big, so if you have a recursive call that's going wrong, you'll run into one quite quickly. And that's the idea behind the stack. That's what it achieves. You may be wondering where this stack data structure comes from. I mean, does it just appear out of nowhere? Does the stack come from the OS? Does it come from .NET's runtime? Where is this data structure coming from? And who is making these modifications to it? How is it that when you return from a function, it pops items. How is that happening? Well, initially other systems like the OS or runtime may be involved, but once things are underway, the thing that actually controls the stack, all the pushing and popping and everything, is your code. Not your code, but your code after compiling. All that pushing and popping that happens when you call and return a function, the way that's done is the compiler actually inserts a few instructions, a few steps for the CPU, into your code when it runs that do what's needed to push and pop. This works really well because they're so easy to do. Literally all the stack data structure needs to work is two pointers. And those pointers aren't even in your RAM. They're in the registers, memory built into the CPU, that your code can just increment and decrement at will as it calls and returns. It's really easy to do. And that's why the stack is controlled by your code. Instructions are inserted at calls and they're inserted at returns. Let's look at the heap. The heap is completely different. The stack is a simple data structure that we can easily understand and see. But the heap isn't even really a data structure, it's more of a system. It's an entire massive program in itself, but the basic job it performs is quite simple. The heap provides a pool, a big block of memory that your program can reserve and unreserve space in at will. It's mainly used to store objects. An example of an object that goes on the heap is a class. When you make a new instance of a class, space is reserved on the heap to store the contents of it. And at its core, that's the heap's job. It's a big block of memory that, through a complex bookkeeping system, you can reserve places out of at will. This process of reserving a space on the heap is called allocating. We allocate to the heap. And this is all well and good, but a few of you might have noticed a problem here. We can allocate space, but when exactly doesn't, unallocation occur. I mean, we can't keep these classes here forever. If we reserve some space for a my class instance, we might stop using that instance at some point. In which case, that space needs to be freed so future allocations can use it. Otherwise, the memory would just go infinitely up and up as our program runs. And that's called a memory leak. The stack doesn't have this problem, so something has to be done. Introducing the garbage collector. I think we've all heard of this. The garbage collector is a freeing mechanism for the heap. It finds unused reservations on the heap, unused allocations, and frees them, so future reservations can use that space. 
And that is what the garbage collector does. And that is all that it does. In fact, it's so tight in the heap that in the case of C Sharp, it actually is the heap. I mean, literally, if you go into the source code and you look at the code to do a heap allocation, that call goes straight to the garbage collector. A lot of the bookkeeping that the heap does is specifically built around how the garbage collector does its freeing. The two are not separated at all. They are just one component. So, okay, but what are objects? What isn't an object? How do the stack and heap work together? They seem a little disjointed at the moment. Well, to understand these questions, we have to move a layer up step away from the theoretical and start looking at how, in practice, these data structures are actually utilized. We have to talk about data types. We are in C-sharp after all. Types are an important part of the code safety we do here, but they're also a very important guide that informs C-sharp what's supposed to happen in memory. And you can get some incredible control over memory when you know the impact they have. I'm sure you've noticed, but in C-sharp, there's a surprising amount of data types. Integers, arrays, classes, struts, records, delegates, floating point numbers, strings, uh, anonymous types within link expressions. There's a lot going on. But here's what's cool. Every single one of these types can be organized into one of two categories. There are value types and there are reference types. Almost everything in C-sharp is a reference type. There are only two things that aren't reference types. Primitive number types like integers and floating point numbers and struts. Primitive numbers are because, as we'll see, it doesn't make much sense any other way. And struts are because this is literally all they do differently from classes. The only reason struts exist is to allow you to make your own value types. That's what they're there for. And as you'll soon see, that's really powerful for performance. All right, but what does this actually mean? What does it mean for something to be a value type and for something to be a reference type? Well, to answer that, we have to take a closer look at how these two categories behave in memory. And to do that, I'm gonna start with reference types first. Reference types follow one rule. I'm about to describe it to you and they, without fail, always follow this rule. So remember this well. When you make a new reference type, say we make a new class, it allocates a space on the heap to hold the type's data and puts a reference, a pointer, to that space where you put the class. Consider this code here. Here, we're declaring a reference type with two long fields in it. And above, we have a function that makes a new instance of the class. Let's see what the second heap looked like when we run this line of code. Since we're starting inside the function already, I'll make sure to put in some space for our local variable, as is the standard for the stack. So let's follow the rule. We're creating a new instance of our class. So that's an allocation to the heap, a new space dedicated. And inside that space is where our two long sit, like so, because that's what reference types do, per our rule. That's the right half of the line. But if you look, we're putting our class into a local variable. So what do we do? We put a reference in the local variable. So the stack now contains a reference to the class and its data on the heap. And so this is what it looks like. This is what you get in memory when you do this. Because whenever you create an instance of a reference type, it puts the contents in a new space on the heap and puts down a reference wherever you put it. And it doesn't matter where you put it. Whether you put the class in a local variable, in the field of another class, in an array, it doesn't matter where it is. It will always put a reference there referring to its own space on the heap. Because that's what reference types do, always. This reference it puts down takes up four bytes on a 32-bit system and eight bytes on the 64-bit system. Personally, I always just assume 64-bit. So from now on, I'm just gonna call this an eight byte reference. And this is the basic idea behind reference types. If we look at another example, it's the same thing. Now, in addition to our my class from earlier, I'm also going to introduce another class called another class. And you'll see that this class has two fields in it. One is a my class field using our class from earlier and the other is a long field. And let's say I then do this. What's this going to look like in memory? Feel free to take your guesses. Well, first we have to get a new spot on the heap to store our another class and the fields in it. And at some point we'll also be putting a reference into our variable CL. So let's just do that now. In reality, it would happen after the constructor, but good enough. Okay, great, but we're not done yet. Our class's constructor sets the field to a new my class, so we need to make that class too. So we're going to perform another allocation to the heap to hold the my class and its fields. 
And then, because I'm putting that class into the A field in another class, I'm going to put a reference into that field. And this reference will refer to that new spot on the heap like so. Again, it's the same rule. So you'll notice we've now created two different spots on the heap. One holds the another class, the other holds the my class. And this is what the memory looks like for this app. Now, I'm sure you noticed this glaring simplified text here. I know, it's been taunting us this whole time, but it's a very simple thing just like last time. Each of these allocations we do also contain extra data in them. This allocation does not contain two longs. It contains a header and two longs. Now, what's inside this header isn't for this video. It's very interesting and a great separate video, but for now, just know that the headers is where the class can store inheritance information, lock information, garbage collection information, and some misc stuff like hash code information. These headers are 16 bytes each, so they're pretty chunky overheads on each class, but they're there, and it's worth knowing about when I get into some of the performance impact of all this. There's a good chance you've seen this references thing I'm talking about in action. It has some interesting effects. So here I have a very simple program. I have a my class here with an integer in it, and in my main I make an instance of it. Alright, so far we know what that looks like in memory. That's one allocation to hold the fields, and one reference assignment to put in our local variable on the stack. Now let's say I add this. What has this done in memory? You may think each variable now contains its own copy of the class, but that's not what's happened at all. In fact, if we look, what we've actually done is, we did copy something, but not the class. We copied the reference to the class. I took that 8 byte reference I had in variable CL, and I made a copy of it and put it into variable CL2. And they're both the same. This means that if I ever need to change something about the object, like changing the integer inside it, it will appear to affect both. The only thing we can do that won't impact the other variable is to set the variable. So if I did this somewhere, this won't affect CL. It will make the new class, then update the reference in just CL2 to the new class. Unless, of course, I then do CL equals CL2, which will then take the 8-byte reference that's in CL2, make a copy of it, and put it into CL. And now, as you can see here, both of them are referring to the same instance again. In fact, you may notice that no one is referring to the first instance anymore. And at some point, it won't necessarily be instant, but at some point, the garbage collector will decide to take a look at what references we have in our app, detect that there aren't any to this class, and free up the space as a result. Great, reference types, love them already, and basically everything does this. There are a few exceptions where they'll do something better. For example, string literals don't make a new allocation. Instead, those take advantage of some read-only memory in your app, and simply put down a reference to that. Delegates also have some caching in the compiler, so they don't have to allocate all the time, so yeah, there's some bending of this for some. But fundamentally, this is the idea. So what about value types? Well, value types do something arguably even simpler. Here's the rule for value types. Their contents get placed at the exact location you place them. That's it. Let's say I make a struct with two longs in it, similar to our previous class, and I then have my main make an instance of that. In memory, this looks like this. Notice how the A and B are stored directly in my local variable on the stack. Well, that's what value types do. They put their data, their contents, right where you put them. What if I put a value type in a field in a class? Well, here's some code. Let's see what happens on this line. As we know, we're making a new class here, so we're going to allocate space for that, and since we're putting the class into the local, we'll put the reference down there on the stack. But now, because the my strut is in a field inside the class, its contents will go right there inside the class. Notice how the struts data, or the stuff inside the strut, is stored right at the field in my class. Well again, that's what a value type does. This is one of the most powerful things about struts. Also notice, they are not on the stack. This example here shows it clearly. Here, my strut is inside a class, but they do let you use the stack directly by using them on local variables instead of using it to just refer to data. So that incorrect statement is a half truth because they do let you use the stack. Now, you may have noticed by the lack of simplification sign that our struts actually don't have any headers on them. They are quite literally just the contents in memory. As a result, you can't lock on a value type, and you can't do inheritance with a value type either. 
The lock thing is purely because of the lack of headers, but the inheritance thing isn't because of the lack of header. Inheritance with struts is physically impossible because the thing containing the strut has to give it a designated amount of space. If we look at our local variable example from before, if you look at the stack here, the stack has made room to hold these two longs. Nothing more, nothing less. The stack can't fit anything else here. We can't just make an inherited strut with a third long. It wouldn't fit in the variable. So that's why you can't inherit from struts because they go right in their target at a fixed size. You can't just go adding fields to them. It works for reference types because that reference of theirs separates the allocation, which can be whatever it wants, however big it wants, and vary however it wants, from the place the object goes. And that's the difference between value types and reference types in memory. Okay, well, this is all great, but what does this mean for you? Is there a benefit to value types? They certainly seem better from these diagrams, but are they? And why do we use reference types so heavily if value types are so great? Well, there's only really one reason value types exist. Performance. If we get really picky, there's some interrupt benefits to them too. It's nice to have there, but who cares about that? Marshal stuff yourself. When used right, value types almost always perform faster than reference types do, sometimes to a massive degree. And to understand how to use them right, I'm going to explain the key reasons why they perform better. Let's start with the first one. These allocations, man. Every class, every array, they take an allocation to get going. And here's the thing, allocating to the heap takes effort. It takes work for the garbage collector to find a new spot ready for your class to use in its bookkeeping. Making it do this a lot, it's not particularly nice. Because of just how reference type heavy we are in C-sharp, the garbage collector is intentionally designed to make mass allocation as painless as it can, but of course, it'll always be faster to just not do them at all. But okay, fine. Some delay when we first make our classes, we can deal with that, and we do. But there's something else all these allocations cause as well. Garbage collection. Every single allocation we do is more garbage the collector has to sometime down the line, deal with. When our app starts to run out of memory, the GC tries to get rid of anything that's not being used in the heap. And there's a stage in this process called the sweep stage where it literally loops through everything on the heap and determines whether to keep it or free it. So all these allocations, they're adding stress to the GC. Now it's all well and good me standing, well, sitting here and talking about this, but let's run a test ourselves and look at some cold hard numbers to see some of the impact allocations have. A C-sharp performance life tip. If you ever want to take benchmarks of C-sharp code, you should always prefer the library benchmark.net. Don't use stopwatch to measure speed. I know you've done it. Don't lie to me, we've all been there, but stop. Use benchmark.net, you'll get a better result. The benchmark I'm going to run here is probably one of my favorite examples of value versus reference. What we're going to do is we're going to make an array with a million items, and we're going to do two tests. One test has a million struts within the array, so in other words, one single massive allocation with everything together, and the other test has a million classes. In other words, one array allocation containing a million references plus a million more allocations. And we're going to see how they compare. Here's my benchmark class. This is the class approach, and this is the strut approach. Feel free to pause and analyze the code all you like. The only thing I'd point out is you may notice I'm returning my array here. I'm intentionally doing this to avoid optimizations from the compiler. If I get rid of this return, the compiler might notice that my variable isn't being used, and that could make it remove this allocation or do something that'll alter my results. We don't want that, so I return it. Something you already noticed just from the code is a cool thing about struts. I don't even need to initialize them in a loop. Value types can't be null. They'll always come in a usable state of some description. So that's cool. I don't even need a loop here. So hold your breath, get ready, because here are the results. Unsurprisingly, struts absolutely kill the classes. I think just looking at the memory diagrams between the two makes it pretty clear why. There's just no competition. It also mentions that the class approach seems to be bimodal. This is probably because it keeps garbage collecting the class approach every other go and it's creating this bimodal distribution. It gets better though. This is beyond the scope of this video, 
But with the strut way, I can take this even further and use a function called gc.allocateUninitializedArray. This allocates an array that's filled with garbage. Basically what that means is it doesn't set anything inside the array to zero. Our longs could start off with anything in them. So this is a really neat function to skip that zeroing step if you're filling up the array with values immediately after or you just don't care. However, this function only works if you have no reference types anywhere in your array because references unfortunately have to be zeroed otherwise they confuse the GC. So if we use this function, which we can only use on struts, let's see what we get now. We have a shocking 500 microseconds versus 67 milliseconds. The strut way is about 140 times faster. And it gets even better. Even if you're okay with this added allocation and cleanup time, our class-based approach isn't just slower to allocate and set up, but it's also slower to use. The class approach, if we look at the diagram here, has spread our longs out in memory. In my heap diagram, I show these allocations as being next to each other, but that's not necessarily true at all. They could be gigabytes apart for all we know, and this spreading of data is not a good thing for the CPU, for two reasons. The first one is quite obvious when you think about it, the CPU cache. The CPU has a cache inside it that's meant to cache memory accesses. Because of how it's designed and how cache lines work and everything, that system works the best when your memory is as close together as possible. Our strut approach has done this. The second problem is slightly less obvious, but you can actually see it from looking at the diagram. It's actually these arrows. Anytime you give the CPU a reference, it has to perform what's known as a dereference. It has to follow the arrow, if you will, to get at the longs. And that takes work too. We call these indirections. Each new reference, each new arrow the CPU has to follow to get at data is an indirection. And for performance, you want as few as possible. All right, let's just land the finishing blow to classes already, and then we'll talk about why they exist. Memory usage. If you've been paying attention, I think you can already see just how hard of a finishing blow this is. In the strut approach, we have 2 million longs. So ignoring our negligible array, we're sitting at about 16 megabytes in memory. A lot of bytes for certain, but let's see what the class approach has done. In the class approach, we have a million object headers, a million references, and 2 million longs. That's 40 megabytes of memory. It doesn't sound awful and it's not terrible, so hopefully this gives you some reassurance your previous software hasn't been complete trash, but man, all these things combined and it really doesn't look good, does it? Which kind of begs the question, why do value types even exist? Why are they so standard and heavily relied on in C Sharp given these issues? Well, let's talk about it. Struts have flaws too. They are three pretty big flaws to be precise. And these flaws are just enough to push reference types to be a much nicer experience to use. Not necessarily needed, but nicer. And in this modern rapid development world, therefore preferable. The first flaw is you can't do everything on the stack. And without reference types around, you would never get onto the heap. The heap does exist for a reason, you know. There are two reasons you can't do everything on the stack. Number one, it's small. Small enough that you wouldn't dare try to, for instance, put my array from earlier on there. That's begging for a stack overflow. And number two, data keeps disappearing off it. When you return from a function, all your newly pushed stack data is gone. So you'd have to return every single thing you want to keep around from a function and bring it up to a function that you won't return from, like main. Which, you've basically just made an inefficient heap with the stack at that point. And trying to do this would be not only impossible, because you usually don't even control half your call stack, but even if you found ways to get libraries to pull your stuff up, you would then crash horribly into strut floor number two, copying. This is quite a big one. It's definitely one of the key things that's pushed this reference type model for the language. Every time you pass a value type somewhere, it gets copied. If I have a 32 byte strut here, and I have two variables, and I do this, how much memory is this gonna take up on the stack? It's gonna take up 64 bytes, 32 bytes for each variable. And when I do B equals A here, it has to copy all 32 bytes from variable A into variable B, because what else can it do? 
variable b says it contains this strut, so the variable is expecting to have all 32 bytes of data stored right there inside it, and the only way it can have that data stored right inside it is by copying all of it across when you set it. Now, obviously, you wouldn't write something like this in your code, but you would pass your strut as a parameter, for instance, which would do exactly the same thing as here. If you have a strut that's 8 bytes or less, then great, this isn't a problem for you. You're going to be doing exactly the same amount of copying as you would a reference type. And the CPU can move 8 bytes in one go, so that's nothing. Generally, any strut that's 16 bytes or less will be fine, but as you go up, the amount of work needed starts becoming a problem. There is a sort of solution to this problem, however, which is to use ref. The ref keyword lets you pass a reference to your original strut down to a method, and it definitely helps this situation. If I write code that does this, and I'm on this line of code, we have this in memory now, no copies. You can see how much less data that is. However, this still has problems. If you forget to write ref anywhere, you could end up accidentally copying, which could really slow things down. And if you look at this solution, we have also just added an indirection to our value type. I want to emphasize that dereferencing is a really small cost. This isn't a massive deal, but it's something that we said value types do better than reference types and not anymore. But this ref approach still doesn't fix our problem because this only works for parameters. You can't return a ref to a strut on the stack. And that's not because it's some arbitrary design decision the C-sharp designers made. It's because it's physically impossible to do that in memory. Consider this example. It looks pretty innocent, but if we actually think about this and how the stack behaves with returns, you'll see just how disastrous this is. If we go through this, we enter the function, the strut is pushed onto the stack. Fine so far. We get to the return, the return needs a ref, so we make a reference to our strut. Okay, that's fine. And then we return from the function, so our strut is popped off the stack. Ah, hopefully you can see the issue. We now have a reference to nothing. We're returning a reference to a strut that doesn't exist anymore. So you can't return refs to local variables. You could pass a ref in as a parameter and then modify it or use out, which is just a fancy ref, but all in all, you really have to force this to work. And with the scale of apps, that's just not gonna happen across the entire thing. And the final killer is sometimes you need value types. We like inheritance, you can't have that with value types. The whole references thing where one bit of code can modify the value in another, that's useful too. If you have multiple threads in your process or any kind of back and forth system like async, you need a place you can put data that'll share between them, like the heap. So all in all, relying entirely on struts just won't work. There's also one other feature reference types have that value types don't. This isn't really a deal breaker, but it's there. Null. Value types cannot naturally be null by themselves, while reference types can. If you look at these two lines of code here, the first line compiles, but the second does not. And the reason for this is it's all about what null means. What null actually means with its origins is the reference is set to zero. When you have a reference type, you, well, have a reference that you can make zero to represent null, to represent that it's not set to anything. But in value types, you don't have that. So by themselves, they can't be null. It's just impossible. There's no way to communicate that state. The solution to this is to attach a boolean to the strut to remember whether it's currently null or not. But of course, we don't want to add a boolean to every single value type. That's not very efficient. So in C sharp, it offers this feature only if you put a question mark on the type like this. In newer C sharp versions, they added a feature where you also have to put question marks on reference types if you're planning on making them null. But this is purely a cosmetic thing for nicer warnings. It doesn't have any impact on the memory. These two are the same in memory, so don't worry. So hopefully you can see that you really can't live on value types. Reference types are way kinder architecturally. So now comes the very difficult question. When should you use one or the other? Well, it's really up to you. For me personally, there's usually a few key scenarios where I tend to find myself using value types. The first is as aliases wrapping around something eight bytes or less. Struts make for really nice wrappers because they cost nothing to make. 
They're especially nice when you get pointers back from a language like C or C++ and you want a strut that'll sit around that and give it a nice interaction layer. That's really neat. And number two is if they can reasonably be used without movement. And what I mean by that is if I can contain my strut in a place like an array where I'm never going to take it out. My example with the 1 million item array is a perfect example of this. I love arrays with strut items because I don't have to take the strut out of the array to use it. I can just index in and access the data directly. There's no copying here. It's a clean single indirection access into our array and straight to the data within there. This being said, do be warned struts don't work particularly well on lists or more complex collections. Unlike arrays, those all have indexes and logic written in C-sharp, which, surprise, may return the strut and copy it. There's some with ref returns, but it's not guaranteed. On top of that, lists in particular have quite an interesting trade-off if you put struts in them. Internally, a list uses an array to store its items. And when you fill that array up, it allocates a new, bigger array, copies from the old to the new, and uses that instead. That's how lists work. If we're storing big struts instead of array, instead of just references with a reference type, we're making that array allocation a lot bigger. And that's more data the list then has to copy across when it resizes. So depending on the circumstance, I tend to just reserve this for raw arrays. And these tend to be the scenarios I use them. You just have to think about the things I've talked about Take a lot of benchmarks of your code, comparing before and after, and see where you end up. So, the stack, the heap, allocations, garbage collection, value types, reference types, indirections, we've covered so much ground this video. There are two more things I want to discuss to close this off. Firstly, I want to talk about the stack alloc keyword briefly, and what that's all about, because it's pretty cool. And secondly, well, I said quite a few times in this video, that you can't do inheritance with value types because they don't have an object header to store that information and again because of how they function in memory. So if inheritance isn't possible with value types, what's this? Or this? How are these possible? These are forms of inheritance. This is something I definitely want to talk about first and it's called boxing. Boxing is bad. To explain what's happening here, we first have to understand that objects and interfaces are reference types. The variable only has space for an 8-byte reference, and this reference is of interest to the garbage collector and everything standard there. That means that if you put a reference type into a variable with one of these, it's pretty happy. Nothing special has to happen at all. The reference is literally just copied into the variable, and it's pointing at the heap where there's a header to inform it of the real type. It's all pretty clean, but c -sharp would like you to be able to put anything in these variables. So, here's a bit of code. When we're on this line, I think we're all happy with what the stack and heap look like. But when we get to the next line, it does the only thing it can do. It allocates a new space and copies the strut's contents into that new space. Take a look at what we've done. We've basically turned our strut into a class. It's also put in a header so it can identify what the real type is and all in all it's essentially created a class out of our strut. The original strut is still intact, it's still in the variable it was in, but a copy has been made on the heap for our object variable. And this happens every time you cast from the strut down to an interface it implements or object. And we call this boxing because we've boxed our value type up into a heap allocation. This is one of the biggest reasons the object type is so harmful. It stops value types from being value types. Generics were specifically invented to stop this. They stop you from having to use these base classes and help you avoid this allocation and regression of our beautiful value type. If you cast the object variable back into a strut again, it goes through a process called unboxing, where it checks the cast is valid, then copies the contents into the variable we need. This way is way kinder to performance. And just to be clear about this term, this is the only time it's called boxing. I've seen people in the past call value types within reference types, like my array from earlier, boxing. That's not boxing. Boxing is specifically when exactly this has happened, because of it being placed into a base class variable. This is also one of the biggest problems with the equals function. It takes an object as a parameter, so if you do it to a value type, you're boxing it. I remember back when I didn't know better, I had a program once that used equals on a value type. A hundred thousand times per loop. Years later, when I knew more about this, I looked at it again and thought, hold on, this line is boxing here. And upon fixing it, 
it went from a 10 second operation to a 10 millisecond operation. One line of code changed. So that's boxing. How about stack outlook? I mentioned that earlier. This keyword sounds a lot more exciting than it really is, but it is very useful. Stack outlook lets you make an array on the stack. That's all it does. To use it, you have to use the span T data type, something I want to talk a lot more about in another video. So you know what to do if you want more content like this. But stack outlook is pretty easy to use. You just write this. You don't even have to use unsafe or anything. And you now have 10 integers in a row on your stack, just like an array, which you can do what you like with. Except return or put on a thing on the heap because that could last after your return. The items of your stack array can be anything that doesn't contain reference types. So struts without reference type fields, primitives, whatever you like. And you can do it with any variable size. It doesn't have to be 10, it can even be a variable. This is really useful. And since span T is a very standard data type that most decent APIs nowadays accept in place of arrays, you can actually use this for a lot and save an allocation if your stack allocated array isn't sticking around. Just don't make your array too big. You don't want to overflow. The recommended maximum is 1024 bytes. And I think that'll have to be it for this video. But there's still so many questions left. What is span T? How do pointers play into memory? What tricks can we do with refs? How are they different from pointers? What more can you do with stack alloc? How is it that when you have a delegate, you're magically able to access local variables? I mean, the delegates on the heap, how is that safe? Hell, how does async do it? Well, I'm glad you asked, because all of these questions and more, I'm heading for them, and I will answer them if it's the last thing I do. Check out this video for a look on pointers, what they do, and why they're pretty useless and span T, rest, and more do everything faster. Thanks for watching.